Good morning. Let's all stand together. Grab your blue hymn books this morning. Turn to page number 259. Page number 259 as we all stand up and sing out unto God. Be the glory. Great things he hath done. Amen. 259. pretty day could we? it is a gorgeous day outside but as good as it is out there i like it better in here i'm yeah, excited man. for what the lord has for us this morning so let's go to prayer and then when i'm done praying you'll be seated and the choir is going to sing to us they're going to sing great are you lord do you think he's great amen. worthy to be praised amen. amen let's pray lord thank you for this time to gather together thank you for loving us in spite of us and the many blessings you've bestowed to us lord we're grateful Lord, I do ask that everything that is said and done here brings you honor and glory, points every heart and every eyes to you. Lord, I do pray that you would please bless every aspect of our service. I lift up the children's churches downstairs in the nursery. I pray that you'd just watch over them, bless them. Lord, please be with those who could not meet with us today. Just watch out for them, keep them safe. Lord, for those who are here, though, we desire a touch from heaven. Would you please speak to our hearts? Would you comfort us? Would you convict us? Would you encourage us? Would you do a work in us? And we praise you for it. Lord, please bless now the choirs. They minister to us in song and bless the preaching to follow. We'll praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated.
wondering why he said, great are you, Lord. That didn't sound anything like great are you, Lord, did it? It's because that's what he has on here. And then I threw him a curveball and did something different. Just well. keep him on his toes. No, it's because I actually put the wrong thing down. But anyway, we won't talk about that. But we will sing 324 as our next song as we all stand together. 324 in those blue hymn books as we sing about that wonderful, matchless grace of Jesus. Amen. 324. <laughs> Take a moment and greet one another.
make our way back to our seats. Grab that blue hymn book, 324. We'll sing out on that last verse of the wonderful grace of Jesus. Page 324 on that last verse. Wonderful grace of Jesus, reaching the most defiled by its transforming power, making him pass child, purchasing peace and heaven for all eternity. And the wonderful grace of Jesus reaches. say my ushers are on the spot but today I'm gonna have you sit down <laughs> so you got all up here on the front's fine if you guys all want to sit here and the rest of y'all can be seated as well it is the first Sunday of the month and I want to embarrass I mean acknowledge some people if I may so first off we will do some anniversaries anniversaries uh, brother Brian Fox you're in the foyer is your wife here Okay, hey, Brother Brett, will you go tell Brian to go get his wife and come up here, okay, please? And uh, let's see. Um, where's your wife? Nursery. nursery. Abandon the nursery. All right. Well, hold on, Miss Abria. All right, well, how about this? Miss Abria, we're going to all focus right now on you. Um, it is your birthday on May 8th. Hey, Miss Carly, are you going to go get them? All right. Thank you, ma'am. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. I am not going to embarrass you more than I already have. But she does want you to know that her birthday is May 8th, and she desires all eyes on her. So anyway. <laughs> but uh, okay. I was getting ready to do that so then you could go, but Miss Carly's doing that. She doesn't have a birthday, does she, Matt? Okay. She better not. Like, we're just everybody upstairs now, okay? So, all right, so they're going to do that. How about this? We'll start with uh, Brother Ryan, Miss Christine Maglinger. You guys have an anniversary on May 27th, is that right? And how many years, think, we're all scared to death at answering this, and I don't know why I keep having my fellow men do this, but I do it anyway. Uh, how, many, how many years on the 27th? This is sweet 16. Our marriage is old enough to drive. <laughs> Okay, all right. I mean, sweet 16, I was like, there's some points there, and marriage is old enough to drive. So, well, amen. <laughs> Driving to happiness, right? Hey, yeah, there you go, amen. All right, let's see the Friels. I guess Shane and Sylvia aren't here today, Brother Archie. All right, they have an anniversary. The, let's see, Drew, you can just come sit by Grandma, okay? Uh, let's see, the Butlers, you guys have an anniversary on the 19th, right? 49 years, that's right, almost 50, praise the Lord for that. The Brennemans, you guys have a wedding anniversary on the 22nd. How many years will it be on the 22nd? 29, 29, 29 years for the Brennemans, a lot of anniversaries. And the Bogans, now Brother Rick's not feeling well today, right? All right, Miss Cheryl, how many years will it be on the 19th? 49 years on the 19th, what a blessing for... Brother Rick and Miss Cheryl Bogan, that is awesome. And uh, where, where's your wife at? Is she coming? Okay, you don't know. Brother Brian, if anyone's going to know, it'd be you. All right. So she doesn't tell you anything. All right. She just. All right. Well, let's see. Are there any other anniversaries aside from Brother Brian and Miss Charlotte? Any other anniversaries, wedding anniversaries in May? Anybody else? All right. Well, now let's just awkwardly wait for Miss Charlotte, I suppose. So, so, but uh, she's coming. To, well, you know, I mean, if you knew I was getting ready to embarrass you, you wouldn't exactly rush up here either, right? She's questioning every decision that's got her to this point. So, well, Brother Brian Fox, let me ask you, how many years will it be on May 17th? 14. 14, that's what I have here. Ding, ding, ding. You got it, man. Good job. So, 
you guys don't understand the fear in the eyes of every man when I ask that. And they're like, because they, they come in knowing. If you're like me, you come in knowing. But all of a sudden, when the pastor singles you out, you're like, uh, uh, I don't know my name or where I'm at or what's going on. So, Miss Sharla, you have an anniversary on the 17th. And Brother Brian Fox, when I asked him how many years, he said 12 years. Is that right? He, did, he didn't say that, I promise. He, he, did, he got it right. He got it right, I promise. She, I love, she had the smile. She's like, did he? <laughs> we'll be talking about that over lunch. So anyway, a lot of anniversaries this month. Are there any other wedding anniversaries I did not mention? Anybody else? All right, well, let's sing happy anniversary to these folks. Ready? Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary, God bless you. Happy anniversary to you. Amen. All right, let me embarrass some birthdays. And let's see, Drew is up here. And okay, Andrea. Andrea is up here. Amen. All right. There may be others. I don't know. I can just go by this list I have. But Miss Sarah Gendron, there you are. You have a birthday on May the 8th, right? Next Sunday. And so your birthday is on Mother's Day. Man, and Miss Abria, your birthday is on Mother's Day. So twice the present. I'm just saying, man. I'm just, yeah, you may, you may want to double up on that. So, amen. I appreciate these ladies. Miss Sarah Gendron's birthday on the 8th. Miss Abria Leek's birthday on the 8th. And let's see, Matthew. Matthew Hugler, are you up here? No. no? Yeah. Matthew, are up here? No. <laughs> you, you didn't really think that one through, Matt. <laughs> Your birthday's on the 8th. And Matthew, how old will you be on the 8th? You think it's 14. I that's what I have here. 14 years old for Matthew Hugler. I appreciate Matthew very much. Let's see, Drew, you have a birthday this month, don't you? What day is your birthday? The 12th. And how old are you going to be on the 12th? Six. My miracle baby turning six. How about that? My soul. Uh, let's see, Miss Christine, you have a birthday on the 19th, right? Amen. So good month for you, right? Good month for you. Amen. I appreciate the Maglingers very much. And you notice I never asked the age of the ladies, so I've learned that not to do that. So She's old enough to drive. She's old enough to drive, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's, yes. All right. So Miss Christine has a birthday on the 19th. And uh, let's see, Eli, is Eli here? Are they here? No. Eli has a birthday on May 24th. Is that right, Miss, Miss Broerman? Okay. Uh, let's see, Elijah Friels. He's not here either. Andrea Burkhart. Your birthday is on the 30th. Now, I could ask your age. I mean, you and I were in the youth group together. I wouldn't care one bit, but, but I won't do that. I won't do it unless you want to share it. Nope. All right. All right. I won't do that. But uh, all right. Miss Andrea's birthday is May the 30th. We appreciate the Burkharts down there laboring every Sunday morning in junior church, and I appreciate their labor there. Brother Lonnie, your birthday is the 25th, right? And how old are you going to be, sir? 47. 47. 47 years old. Amen. Appreciate Brother Lonnie. And he encourages me every Sunday morning for Sunday school. I appreciate his encouraging spirit. All right, I have other names here. I've overlooked them in the past. Is there anybody here who has a birthday in May I didn't mention? Right, Brother Warren's birthday is the 7th. If he's watching, happy birthday, Brother Warren. I saw a hand. Miss Edison, you have a birthday? And you didn't tell me. My soul. All right. Miss Edison Wyatt, when is your birthday? May 13th. Lucky for you. I don't ask the ages of our ladies, but very happy birthday to Mrs. Wyatt, soon to be Mrs. Bunner. Amen. Appreciate you guys. Who else? Birthday in May. Anybody else? Don't make me find out later. I bring the whole church to your door. We sing. We make a big scene. We make a mess. We just... All right. All right. Well, let's sing happy birthday to these folks in May then, shall we? Ready? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. God bless you. Happy birthday to you. All right. Thank you. Miss Andrew, you can head back down. Thank y'all. Drew, you can go back.
back down too, okay? Uh, all right, ushers, come on up. I'm done embarrassing people, except you. I've still got to embarrass you guys. I do want to embarrass, hey, Hunter, do you believe that God provides? Yeah? Brown gravy. <laughs> Will you run that to Hunter real quick? Hunter, wave at my dad so he knows, yeah, give that to him. So if you're wondering what in the world was that, ask Hunter. He loves all the attention. So anyway, God answers prayers, brother. He comes through for you. So he got brown gravy up here. So amen. Let's ask the Lord to bless our offering. Brother Mike Day, would you please do that? Father, thank you so much for allowing us to come in your house today. We just keep praying for nothing. Just have some enjoyment and uh, allow us to light our hearts for it. Uh, stick with us throughout the week so we can do your will. Uh, we just ask that you bless the offering in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. playing for us. Just a few quick announcements, then we'll sing a couple more songs. Tonight, after the evening service, which we are starting a, a new mini-series, The I Am's of Christ. If you look in Scripture, when Jesus says, I am, we are taking one of those names and breaking it down. So that'll be Sunday nights this month. After the service tonight is Teen Cafe. This is a, a meal downstairs, a fellowship meal. Everyone's welcome. And the teenagers uh, charge money for that, and that money goes into their camp fund or just the overall teen fund. So if you're able to stick around for food and fellowship tonight, that is a blessing to them. Uh, if you're unable to be there tonight, but you'd like to make a donation to them, you can always do that. Just put it in an offering plate and write on their teen on there, as in teenager, and we'll make sure it gets there. But that's tonight, so I hope you plan to stick around. Saturday the 7th is the, uh, the Be Filled, the Food Fellowship, the Bible study that Brian, uh, Brother Brian Pease puts on. That's at 6 p.m. this Saturday night. If you'd like to go, you can sign up on the back table. If you have any questions, you can see him about that. Week from today is Mother's Day. I do have a gift for all the moms here, uh, just a small gift for you. I hope it is an encouragement to you. That Sunday morning, we will also have our children take up a VBS offering. So no hundreds, but anything under 100 would be just fine. You say, why no hundreds? Because when they give 100, we have this crazy doctrine up here that says pastor and a child must run a lap shouting, well, glory, if someone gives $100. So nobody's going to give 100 next week. We'll give like 99, but uh, we don't need to give 100, okay? So anyway, nobody wants to see me run a lap. So I said, nobody wants to see me run a lap. Man, you got dead quiet right there, okay. Well, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. But that's next Sunday morning, Friday, May the 13th. The teen activity, that's a scavenger hunt here at the church at 5 p.m. You can see Dylan Burkhart for that. And also, if you currently work in the media technician's realm such as live stream or sound booth or you would like to there'll be a meeting sunday the 15th after the morning service okay so if you have any questions i'll just direct that to brother ryan leak or brother brian pease about that media tech meeting uh, sunday may 15th after the morning message for those who currently work there or you just have some questions about working in there okay all right that's all i got so let's stand and sing shall we Let's go to 279 and let's sing in our blue hymnal in the garden. Page 279, blue hymnal in the garden.
so glad we can have that blessed time spent with him in prayer in the garden. Amen. Page 306 now, page 306 as we sing, Pass me not, O gentle Savior. Page 306. remain standing for the reading of God's word. I want you to take your Bibles, please, to 1 Samuel chapter 8, 1 Samuel chapter 8, and go ahead and just leave your Bibles open. We are going to start with a little bit of a Bible study to lay the foundation of the message. Are you thankful that when you do cry unto the Lord, he hears you? I know I sure am. 1 Samuel chapter 8, please, 1 Samuel chapter 8, 1 Samuel chapter 8, and we're going to start in verse 1, 1 Samuel 8, verse 1. And like I said, just hold your spot there, and we'll lay some foundation here. And I want to talk to you about the tragedy of downgrading, the tragedy of downgrading. I wish I had a more encouraging title for it, but as we go through it, we'll see why I felt led to title it this way. But 1 Samuel chapter 8, please. 1 Samuel chapter number 8. 1 Samuel chapter number 8. This is what it says in 1 Samuel 8, verse 1. It says, And it came to pass, when Samuel was old, that he made his sons judges over Israel. Now the name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second, Abiah, and they were judges in Beersheba. And his sons walked not in his ways, but turned aside after lucre, and took bribes, and perverted judgment. Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together, and came to Samuel unto Ramah, and said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. And uh, I want to talk to you about the tragedy of downgrading, and then we will read more scripture to kind of give us some background here. But let's pray. Lord, we need you now. Thank you very much for those who are here. God, I pray you'd bless them for their faithfulness and encourage them. And Lord, I thank you for the sweet spirit and the singing and the offering and uh, the Sunday school lessons and the children downstairs. You've been so good to us. Lord, I do ask now that you'd please stay any distractions. And I pray that you'd please deal with us and speak to us about this 
very serious problem, Lord, of downgrading in our Christian walk. Please help us, God, to seek after you, to want more of you and not less. I pray that you'd deal with hearts, and I pray that you would use me as just a tool in your mighty hand. God, please give me clarity, give me strength, give me wisdom, give me everything I need. I'll praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. And you can be seated. So hold your spot there in 1 Samuel 8. But now I want you to go to Judges chapter 2, okay? Go backward to Judges chapter 2. And to give a little contextual background, after the death of Joshua, who was the leader, Israel has started a downward spiral, unfortunately, in their walk with God. And what we're going to see is kind of the, I won't call it the start, but we see a little bit of a synopsis in Judges chapter 2, beginning in verse 7, of this gradual decline. So Joshua has passed off the scene, or he's getting ready to in the text here. We'll, we'll read that. And then we just see a, a bad direction that, the, that Israel as a whole, that God's people go after. So we're in Judges 2, and I'm going to start reading in verse 7. Judges 2, verse 7, says, And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua, and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord that he did for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being a hundred and ten years old. And they buried him in the border of his inheritance in Tanatheres, in the mount of Ephraim, on the north side of the hill Gaish. And also all that the generation were gathered unto their fathers. And there arose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and served Balaam. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt, and followed other gods, of the gods of the people that were round about them, and bowed themselves unto them, and provoked the Lord to anger. And they forsook the Lord, and served Baal and Ashtaroth. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he delivered them into the hands of spoilers that spoiled them, and he sold them into the hands of their enemies round about so that they could not any longer stand before their enemies. Whithersoever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for evil, as the Lord had said, and as the Lord had sworn unto them, and they were greatly distressed. Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges, which delivered them out of the hand of those that spoiled them. And yet they would not hearken unto their judges, but they went a-whoring after other gods, and bowed themselves unto them, they turned quickly out of the way which their fathers walked in, obeying the commandments of the Lord, but they did not so. And when the Lord raised them up judges, then the Lord was with the judge, and delivered them out of the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For it repented the Lord because of their groanings by reason of them that oppressed them and vexed them. And it came to pass when the judge was dead that they returned. And corrupted themselves more than their fathers in following other gods to serve them and to bow down unto them. They cease not from their own doings nor from their stubborn way. So what we see is the institution of judges begin. And during the first period of judges, God continues to love Israel in spite of their sin. In spite of the wickedness and the backsliddenness, God still loves them. And by the way, are you thankful that God still loves you in spite of you? So this first judge, his name is Othniel, he is put into power in Judges chapter 3. Flip over to Judges 3, please. Judges chapter 3. And we're going to read verse 9 through 11. So this guy, Othniel, is anointed and put into power in Judges 3, uh, verse 9. It says, And when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer to the children of Israel, who delivered them, even Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he judged Israel and went out to war. And the Lord delivered Chushan Rishtham, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand, and his hand prevailed against Chushan Rishtham. And the king, excuse me, and the land had rest forty years, and Othniel the son of Canaz died. So God, what he would do is he would anoint a judge who was not a king. He would anoint a judge. He was a he was a, a leader. He was a decision maker. Among the countrymen. He was not royalty because God was the only royalty, right? God was the only king. And that's why the Lord could use the judges so well. And the life cycle of a judge was being chosen and then reigning for a little bit and then dying 
That happens several times over through the book of Judges. You can read that later. The judge is chosen. There is peace. The judge dies. People fall into sin and idolatry. God brings judgment, usually by oppression from their enemies. The people then repent. A new judge is chosen. And round and round they go. And that was the life cycle over and over and over and over. Now, let's fast forward to 1 Samuel. Go ahead back to your text in 1 Samuel, please. This is where God is using a prophet priest named Eli. And Eli trains up a young man named Samuel who would go on to do wonderful things for God as the new prophet priest. And he's arguably one of the greatest Old Testament characters you will find in your scripture. The relationship that Samuel and the Lord had always kind of challenged me to be better. You ever watch someone who just has a, a real walk with God? There's like a real joy and a real happiness, and you're like, man, I kind of want that. I feel like that's what was going on here. And for the most part, people responded well to Samuel. And if you flip through the first few books of 1 Samuel, you'll see some interesting things happen under his oversight. There's some good and some bad. But I want you to go back to 1 Samuel 7 really quick. 1 Samuel chapter 7. And uh, look in verse 15 through 17. 1 Samuel 7, 15 through 17. It says, And Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life. And he went from year to year and circuit to Bethel and Gilgal and Mizpah and judged Israel and all those places. How many of y'all are old enough to remember circuit riding preachers? Some of y'all, a few hands, okay, yeah. So it says he went from year to year in circuit, verse 17, and his return was to Ramah, for there was his house, and there he judged Israel, and there he built an altar unto the Lord. So now let's review for just a moment. God picks a man to lead, beginning with Moses, who leads Israel out of Egyptian slavery. God is using Moses to bring them to the promised land. There's blessings and provision galore, and the people are so content. No, they're not. The people cannot stop complaining and murmuring, so God disciplines them. He must po uh, postpone their destination. He causes them to wander the wilderness for 40 years. Joshua then takes the mantle. He leads, and the people follow Joshua. But, of course, the people are never fully satisfied. And after Joshua dies, then turmoil ensues. And God would rather that they just listen to the prophet priest. God would rather that they just followed after him. But the people clamor for someone else. So God institutes this thing called judges. And this lifestyle has taken them all the way to where we are in the passage in Samuel. So God has given them judges like they wanted. And now here they are. Now let me ask you a question. Are the people finally satisfied? No, no, they're not satisfied. That's crazy, isn't it? Proverbs 27, 20, hell and destruction are never full, so the eyes of man are never satisfied. So this is where our opening text comes into play. Samuel's sons were not living as they should be, and partly due to this, they start to cry out for a king. And we saw that in chapter 8, verse 5. Now they want a king. A judge is not good enough. A prophet's not good enough. God himself is not good enough. They want a king. So Samuel doesn't like it, so he goes to prayer. Now, are you there with me in 1 Samuel chapter 8? Okay, we're going to start reading in verse number 7. So you follow along as I read aloud, okay? It says, And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people, and all that they say unto thee. For they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. Say, okay, they don't want to answer to God, they want a man. They want a face, they want someone else. According to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them up out of Egypt, even unto this day, wherewith they have forsaken me and served other gods, so do they also unto thee. Now therefore hearken unto their voice, howbeit yet protest solemnly unto them, and show them the manner of the king that shall reign over them. And Samuel told all the words of the Lord unto the people that asked of him a king. So now Samuel has done commune with the Lord. And now he's going to go talk to the people who are demanding a king. Verse 11, this is kind of his sermon, his warning. And he said, this will be the manner of the king that shall reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for himself, for his chariots, and to be his horsemen. And some shall run before his chariots. And he will appoint him captains over thousands and captains over fifties. And will set them to ear, uh, set them to ear his ground and to reap his harvest, and to make his instruments of war, and instruments of his chariots. And he will take your daughters to be confectionaries, and to be cooks, and to be bakers. And he will take your fields, and your vineyards, and your olive yards, even the best of them, and give them to his servants. 
And he will take the tenth of your seed and of your vineyards and give to his officers and to his servants. And he will take your men servants and your maid servants and your goodliest young men and your asses and put them to his work. He will take the tenth of your sheep and ye shall be his servants. And ye shall cry out in that day because of your king, which ye shall have chosen you, and that the Lord will not hear you in that day. Now, I'm listening to this. I'm kind of thinking maybe having a king ain't such a good idea. Aren't you kind of thinking that? Like, you know, maybe we didn't think this through. Can, can, we, can we have a mulligan, right? Can we, can we think of this over real quick? But look in verse 19. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, Nay, but we will have a king over us, that we also may be like all the nations. See, that's where the problem started, one of them. They weren't looking at God, they were looking at everybody else. They, they thought everybody else had it better than them. Verse 20, it says, And that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. And Samuel heard all the words of the people, and he rehearsed them in the ears of the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Hearken unto their voice, and make them a king. And Samuel said unto the men of Israel, Go ye every man unto his city. So Samuel warns the people about this new normal. He warns them, if this is what you really want, this is what you're going to get. And that's what they got. You see, this is a sad story. The people had everything they could possibly want in God. Man, they had the preacher man, and they had the precepts being preached, and the principles being presented, and things were going well, and God was blessing, and the prophet is there to help them and preach to them, but it's just not enough. Now, you and I can say what fools they are, but the sad thing is we're guilty of the exact same thing. Pastor, pray for me. I'm struggling with this problem. I sure will pray for you. You know, God says that he will be there. He'll help you. Yeah, yeah I know. I don't know, but I need this. Well, pastor, I, I really have this issue. And, well, God says he'll take care of your needs. He'll provide for you. Yeah, 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 I know. But, pastor, I, I really just have this issue. And it's okay, but God addresses that in this chapter. If you read it, if you study, if you pray about it. Yeah, I know what God says about it. But, you see, Jesus can cure what ails us. He's there when no one else is. He's available when no one else is available. I mean, he is the epitome of a savior. That's why he's the savior. He's there to save you, to deliver you, to help you, to encourage you. The Prince of Peace, the Comforter, the Joy. Oh, He gives it all for us. But how often do you and I choose the downgrade from Jesus to the earthly, materialistic things? It seems like sometimes we're guilty of putting earth's answers over God's answers. I understand that Jesus can use things of this earth and use people and use uh, doctors and lawyers and things like that. And I get that, I know. But when your heart is all in for what the world has to offer and has told Jesus to take a sidestep so you can focus on what the world has rather than what he has, friend, there's an issue. And whether you realize it or not, you are downgrading. You are taking a step backward from God to what else is there to choose from? That's exactly what these people did. In their hearts, they were never grateful. They were never content. They always wanted more, or they wanted different, or they wanted better. They were just never, ever content. And God reluctantly says, okay, and he grants them a king. And if you know your history, this young man's name is Saul. How many of y'all heard of King Saul before? You can read about his background. You can read about his selection and anointing, his rise to power over the next few chapters. But... In chapters 13 and 15, we start to see a little bit of what Samuel was warning the people about. All of a sudden, we start to see glimpses of pride show up in old King Saul. We see a little bit of disobedience, disguised disobedience, but disobedience. And overall, we see Saul's inability to completely follow after the Lord. And uh, we see he has a desire to be in full control and not yield unto the Lord what's the Lord's. He just he gets power hungry. Samuel tried to warn them that having a king would bring difficult times, but they did not listen. They only followed after and believed what they thought they knew. They thought their reasoning, they thought their philosophy was over everything God had put in place. They thought that they knew better than God, ultimately. After all, who's this prophet Samuel guy? Who does he think he is anyway? Who is he to tell us what's right and what's wrong? Well, he's only one of the greatest prophets to ever walk this planet. 
but go ahead, choose what you want, keep doing what you think is right and what you feel is best, contrary to what God says. And in 1 Samuel 15, 26, the touch of God moves off of Saul. You see, God can't use someone who's unusable. He cannot use you if you're unwilling to be used. And Saul just wouldn't be used. His unwillingness to obey God is pride. It kept the Lord from using him as Samuel had hoped for. And verse 35 tells us that Samuel mourned due to Saul's backslidden state. And all of a sudden, this great king, this shiny new toy they wanted so bad... He is just one of them, a sinful man that God has to correct. How about that? They wanted a king so bad. And now what do they got? A sinful, power-hungry menace. If you comb through the books of Kings and Chronicles, you'll find Israel and Judah had many kings. Some were good, some were bad. But this is the type of normality that stuck with the people. And this is the normal you and I have to this day. Fast forward to 2022. I know that cultures and countries are different, but they all have something like this in place. There is a king or a, a, a dictator, a government, a, a president of some kind, some kind of ruling body. Sometimes they're good godly leaders, and sometimes they're not so good, not so godly. Proverbs 29.2 says, When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked beareth rule, the people mourn. Compared to other countries in the world, the United States of America is still a baby. Do you know that? We're still a child. We're an infant. We're only 245 years old compared to other countries and dynasties that are thousands of years old. We're a baby nation. But even in the brief time that we have been a nation, look at how far we have fallen. 245 years I mean, imagine if we all teleported back to when it started, or vice versa. What if they teleported to here? They would say, what happened? What, 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 what went wrong? Around the 4th of July, there's a few messages I like to preach recurring. I tell stories of a certain men's prayer meeting at night that got interrupted by something you may know of Paul Revere's ride. I tell you of George Washington's favorite psalm, which was Psalm chapter 1, how it was carved into trees all over his estate, and it was preached at his inauguration. I tell stories of the group of men known as the Black Robe Brigade, which were ministers in the war, meant to pray over the soldiers and preach to them. And you will find that even the enemy soldiers, they could not figure out the power that seemed to just be basking over our soldiers. It was the prayers of these preachers there on the battlefield with them. You see, God was very present at the founding of our nation, wasn't he? Did you know that? God was very present at the founding of our nation. And during the meeting where the Declaration of Independence was signed out loud, they read Psalm 35 150 times, and they did it to gain strength and wisdom for what they were about to do, to go off on their own and trust the Lord with everything. You see, this was founded as a very godly nation. 245 years later, Turn on your television. Look at what's on your cell phone. Look, look at how adults act. Go, go to Walmart and watch just a common interaction at the register. Go to Arby's and look at when a coupon has expired. Look at, look at, the, look at what transpires. Look at how adults are behaving when it comes election time. I think I'm looking at a fight at recess. Look at what some of the schools are teaching. Look at how the name of Jesus Christ is now hushed, but every other false god is heralded. Look at how we don't know the difference between a boy and a girl anymore. I'm still blown away by that one. Look at how prayer in public formats is now discouraged. The tragedy of downgrading. This, this new wokeness, this new culture. Oh, it's for the best. Is it? This is where people, individually or as a group, they decide that, you know what? Jesus just isn't enough anymore. His doctrines, yeah, they helped us out years ago, but now they're just not what they used to be. They're just not good. They're not as efficient. His book isn't enough. 
The doctrines of Christ isn't enough. Prayer isn't enough no more. Biblical teaching and preaching, ah, we don't need it no more. Church isn't enough no more. Christ honoring music, nah, that ain't enough. Strong families, overrated. Healthy, happy homes, no, that's a thing of the past. Good old Bible-based common sense, no, I'd rather have the wokeness nowadays. We think we're upgrading, don't we? We think we're making a good trade when we agree to stop talking about Jesus in public because, well, I don't want to offend anybody. I don't want to scare anybody. I don't want to make anybody melt on me. I don't want to make anyone uncomfortable. I want harmony in the workplace. But how many of those people in that politically correct environment will go to their grave never knowing that Jesus Christ loved them and died for them and gives them a way to heaven? Because we have downgraded to saying, I just want you comfy. Everybody just wants to be comfy. If you come to church for a month straight and not once you've been made uncomfortable by the confrontation of sin and the preaching of this book, then there's something wrong. You're not supposed to be comfortable when you come to church and the Bible is preached. You're not supposed to be comfortable. I mean, pews physically, sure. I don't want you sitting on you know, a hard chair or anything like that, but maybe it keeps some of us awake. I don't know. But uh, what I'm saying is when I'm preaching the book and I say, thus saith the Lord, you shouldn't be comfy at that. It doesn't make me comfy. I don't like preaching it to you. I'd like someone else to be preaching it to me. Amen. <laughs> I, I, it, it's not supposed to make us feel like we're enough, like it's okay. Because Jesus is the only one who's enough. And we need sinful, imperfect people to understand they cannot hope, have hope in themselves. They have to have hope in a Savior who gives them hope. Some of the new stuff out there, it sounds good and it looks good in the break room on a poster, but it's not going to carry you through the midnight hour when your tears have stained your bed and your pillow is so uncomfortable you can't sleep. This just do your best is not going to help you. Jesus is going to help you. And we're trading that because we don't want to offend or upset anybody. I mean, what, what have you traded for? What have we traded Christ for? We're, we're downgrading. doesn't matter what it was. If you went from Jesus to literally anything else, the tragedy of downgrading. You know, I think it, we, we have it all wrong because we've sold out for something. I've decided I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to back off a little bit on my prayer, more, more time doing this in, in my newspaper. Uh, I don't want to read so much because I, I have my shows I watch. I don't want to pray. I don't want to make people uncomfortable at work. What's your price? What have we sold for? We have it wrong. You see, we're compromising Jesus for the comforts of this world when we ought to be surrendering everything we got to him. Lord, help me. Make me a better witness. Make me a better Christian. It says in Philippians 3, and you can go there if you'd like, in Philippians chapter 3, the Lord used Paul to put it in a very good way. Philippians chapter 3. If you'd like to turn, I'll give you a few seconds to turn there. Philippians 3, and I'm going to start reading in verse number 7. Philippians 3, beginning in verse number 7. Philippians 3, beginning in verse number 7. This is what it says in Philippians 3, 7. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. What I read here in a whole lot of other passages, you and I are supposed to give it all we got to know Jesus and to make him known to others. 
We're chipping away at our walk with Christ to make more room in other areas, make more convenience and comfort in other areas when it's like, no, we're supposed to be taken from other areas and giving it to Jesus. Our life is supposed to be Jesus. Our life is supposed to be knowing him and making him known. But as the days go by, I feel like more and more apathy is creeping in and more and more apostasy is creeping in and we're trading in that fire we once had. We're trading in that zeal, that determination, that gung-ho-ness, that I'm for Jesus, I'm all for him, all in. Everything we had, everything that used to be, all of a sudden we're traded it. I'd rather be comfortable. I'd rather have conformity. I'd rather have preference. Ask yourself this and don't answer it out loud. But are you as all in today for Christ as you have ever been? The answer is probably no, because I know my answer is no. What happened? What changed? Well, we live in a day and age where more and more people are choosing that safe route, that, that comfort, comfortable route, that comfort life, rather than a selfless service to the Savior. And you know, Jesus dealt with that in his day too. We won't go there for time's sake, but if you take a note, write down John chapter 6. He preaches hard, he preaches straight, and people say, well, we didn't sign up for this, and they leave him. And Jesus looks at Peter and he says, are you going to leave me too? And Peter has it right. He says, well, you know, who else would I go to? <laughs> who, who's got it better than us when I serve you? Who is stronger than, than you? Who is better than you? What is a more worthy cause than the cause of Jesus Christ? What purpose is more, is more profitable? There is none. Anything in your way of serving Jesus is a downgrade. And in my opinion, it's a tragedy. After everything he has done for me, how could I let anything get in the way of doing for him? I submit to you, church, we need more soul-conscious Christians. We need more zeal in our church again. We, we need more excitement, more fire in our Christianity. We need more prayer. We need more praising and more singing, more voices in the choir, more, no, uh, more hands knocking on doors, and more in Sunday school, and more in church, and more on the buses, and more, and more, and more, not less, more for Jesus. What else is there? What else is there? Everything else is a downgrade. final thing I want to share is this truth. Now that I've got you all discouraged and beat up, let's go to 1 Samuel 16. 1 Samuel 16. King Saul, he was the thing that they all thought they wanted. Just give us a king. Like everybody else, we want a king. God said, okay. Gave him a king. Guess what? Didn't work out. So Saul has backslid. So much that he was unusable. And God has to anoint another king. 1 Samuel 16, beginning in verse 12. 1 Samuel 16, 12. Are you there? And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and with all of a beautiful countenance and goodly to look to. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. Now this new king, relatively unknown shepherd boy named David. How many of y'all ever heard of David? I would venture to say most of you have. David would go on to do incredible things for God. Now he wasn't perfect. Many of his sins are highlighted. But a lot of great things came from this man, David. They came from his reign and a lot of his statutes and a lot of the beloved psalms that we read every day came from David. Here's the point. When you and I are left alone and we can make our own decisions, if you're like me, we tend to make a mess of things, don't we? We think we want it. Oh, we, we finally got some authority, some responsibility. I'll make the say around here. And all of a sudden, you've kind of made a mess of what was entrusted to you. We're not the best stewards, if we'd be honest. How many of y'all have, have young children right now? I mean, you've had young children, right? Okay. <laughs> How many of y'all are like me, and you'd rather hear them kind of being loud and boisterous than all of a sudden getting quiet? Uh-huh. When it gets quiet, that's when the fear arises. 
Because if I can hear him arguing and being loud and doing impressions and racing around the house, it's fine. Annoying, but it's fine. But then all of a sudden when I hear Peyton go, Drew, let's go to the room. And Drew's like, okay. And it's like, I'm listening. Drew, let's do this. Let's do that. Peyton's the mastermind and Drew's the, the muscle. And uh, it, I'll be listening like, it's been way too quiet for way too long. What are they doing? So you go in there. And by the way, this is, I'll just, you, you teens or any kids in the, I'll, this is a tale. If your parents walk in and you immediately go, yeah, that pretty much, yeah, you've given yourself away. Now, if they were just to ignore me and I'm like, hey, guys, you hungry for supper? And they ignore me. That's somewhat, you know, hey, I'm talking to you. Then they look. But if they're already like anticipating you walk in, it's like, ah, what you doing? There's been times it's been so quiet and it's like it's been too quiet. I got to go check. And there is an unusually large mess in their room to the point I don't even know how it was physically possible. Like, I don't even know where these toys came from. These clothes are not ours. Is that one of your friends buried under the hamper? You know, like, who, who are they? What, what happened here? How did you make a mess this big? I feel like sometimes that's the Lord looking at me is, how did you make a mess that big? When we decide we know what's best and we say, I don't think I need supervision. I don't need someone to submit to. I don't need a governing authority. When we think we can outsmart God and do it better than his word, we can make quite the mess. But I want to encourage you with something. God can take a mess and turn it into a masterpiece. Are you thankful for that? That when you and I finally look up and say, what have I done? <laughs> Lord, I'm sorry. You, you gave me this. You entrusted me with this. I messed up. I didn't seek your word. I walked away from you. I thought I could do it, but I messed up. I'm so thankful that God can take issues and situations that stress us out and turn it into something beautiful and honorable for him. Who would have thought that the debacle that was King Saul would yield the blessed years that were King David? When Joseph was betrayed by his brothers and sold into slavery, oh, it was bleak, it was hopeless, but Joseph chose to do right anyway. He chose to honor God, he chose to keep the faith, and he rose in power to, uh, in Egypt over anything he could have dreamed. And he said this in Genesis 50:20. But as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. What I'm telling you is God can take what is stressing you out. God can take that downgrade you made, that mistake you made. God can take it and he'll forgive you for it and say, hey, let's try to make something good from this. Let, let's do something awesome with this. Let's turn that frown upside down and let's do something great. Maybe your life, you'd say, preacher, it's a mess right now. Or maybe you look at the country and you get discouraged at the direction of our country. Maybe you have family and you say, preacher, my family's in turmoil. Or, oh, you ought to see me at work. I'm so stressed at work. My job, I can't stand it. It's just terrible. Maybe it's a relationship between you and somebody else that used to be great. Now it's not so great. When we trade in our contentment for discontentment, there will be problems. When you trade in your gratitude for always looking at something else, what's shinier and what you think you want, I'm telling you there's going to be problems. But if we choose to get thankful for everything and purpose in our hearts that, you know what, Jesus is enough. What he's given me is enough. If he wants to bless me more, that's incredible. But Jesus is truly enough. Imagine what would have happened if they would have quit going after judges and kings and just said, you know what, God and his prophet, they're enough. He's preaching to us. We see how we're supposed to live. That's enough. It wasn't enough for them, and it caused them years of heartache, centuries. So what if you and I today just stopped and said, Jesus is enough. I, I don't need to keep watching the news. I don't need to keep wishing I had grander things and better things. You know what? Jesus is enough. Despite what everybody else is doing, despite what I'm supposed to want, what the world tells me I want, I think I just want Jesus. I think I just want his presence, and I think I just want to do it his way. Let me encourage you, church, don't trade Jesus for anything. I, I don't care what you get in return. You're not for sale. Don't trade Jesus for anything. Keep him first in everything. Watch him bless you for keeping him first. Jesus is worth it. Don't trade. Don't downgrade. Jesus is enough. And by the way, he's wonderful. Lord, would you help us this morning with this?
solemn message. I don't like to be grumpy like this sometimes, Lord, but I'm burdened for folks who think we can do better with less you. Oh, Lord, would you turn our hearts, turn the tide of the direction of our world. Lord, we desire to see revival. We desire to see people turn back to you. But, Lord, that'll happen when we stop selling out, when we stop saying, I'd rather have this than you. Lord, we desire you. Help us to keep our eyes on you, our heart on you, our minds on you. Lord, please help us. We are needy people. We are sinful people. We ask that you forgive us of sins, and we ask that you would please help us, strengthen us in our faith and our walk with you. Forgive us for any trades, any downgrades that have been made. Lord, please help us to stay after you. We'll be so grateful for you. You are enough. Thank you for loving us in spite of us. Thank you for all the blessings you've given us. Lord, we are grateful. We are contented. Please help us in these areas. We'll praise you for it. Do a work in us today. In Jesus' name. Will you stand with me if you can, with nobody talking or looking around, not playing on our phones? And as the music has started, why don't you just do some business with the Lord? Jesus is enough, isn't he? If you'd like to come pray at the altar, the altar's open. I always encourage humble prayer at the altar. The Bible emphasizes the altar quite a bit. Wherever you pray, wherever you're at in your Christian life, tell yourself, Jesus, he is enough. The world wants you to believe he's not quite enough or he's not good anymore. Those times have passed. Here's what you need. You need the newest technology. You need the newest way of life. You need a, a better job, bigger house, faster car. That's what you need. No, friend, we need Jesus. He is enough. Anything other than Jesus is a downgrade. I don't want to be caught in the tragedy of selling out, saying, I thought with a little less Jesus and a little more this, I'd be happier. Turned out that wasn't the case. I needed Jesus. I needed all of him. I needed him every hour. We all do. Whatever your need concern, please don't leave here the same. Leave here changed. Do business with the Savior who is very much alive enough. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus, no, not one, no, not one. None else could heal all our soul's diseases, no. for that.
that. Let's close in prayer, and we will go our separate ways. Thank you so much for coming. I do hope it was a blessing, a challenge to you. We have choir practice tonight. Okay, no choir practice tonight. Church is at 6 p.m. and Teen Cafe after that. So I hope to see you there for that. All right, let's close in prayer, and we will be dismissed. Brother Ryan Maglinger, you need to take care of her this month. All right, all right. See, I put the gauntlet out there so everyone saw it. No pressure. Brother Ryan Maglinger is going to close us in prayer. And when he is done praying, we are dismissed. Thank you so much for coming.